For today, the whole point of this live stream is Kim and I were chatting a few days ago, and she sure. said, that's right, Mitzi. Mitzi <laughs> loves it when Kim and I chat. And Kim mentioned, that's right. <laughs> Mitzi had strong opinions about this. But the Santorini vampires. And... Yeah. It's um, it's okay. They're not coming. We promise. <laughs> yeah. So um, I went to Santorini a few years ago, and you know, thinking it's this beautiful place, the sunset, the wine, you know, the seafood and everything. And part of the tour, they were talking about it was considered the island of the dead, where they knew the vampires lived, and the vampires hunter lived. So if you needed to hunt down vampires, you would go there and talk to them and buy whatever uh, wares they had for sale, right? To hunt them down or to do it yourself, right? Because you could hire them out at the time. So on the island of Santorini, which is off. Yeah, yeah I released Mitzi. She's out barking. <laughs> <laughs> on the island of Santorini, they're hunting vampires. Yes, and if you thought you had a vampire on, let's say, one of the other islands or maybe in Athens, you would go there um, to talk to them and either hire them out or buy whatever to go back and hunt, you know, the vampire yourself. Um, they supposedly had renowned, renowned uh, vampire hunters that lived there because supposedly that's where they went, right? That's where they kind of were born and made more vampires. <laughs> The island of Santorini, they're hunting vampires. Yes, and if you thought you had a vampire on, let's say, one of the other islands or maybe in Athens, you would go there um, to talk to them and either hire them out or buy whatever to go back and hunt, you know, the vampire yourself. Um, they supposedly had renowned, renowned uh, vampire hunters that lived there because supposedly that's where they went. Right, that's where they kind of were born and made more vampires. <laughs> Wait, so the vampires hang out on the island of Santorini. That was the lore, yeah. And then the vampire hunters lived there too and hunted them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. I was like, they're Isn't all dead, right? <laughs> I am just imagining going into their house and you have all these vampire heads mm -hmm. stuffed oh, and oh, mounted oh, on oh, all the walls. Oh, 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 oh. Right? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah. My great grandfather caught that one. <laughs> yeah, it was um, Father uh, Francis Richard who uh, spread some of the vampire tales uh, back in the 1700s. So, and it just, it's, you don't really hear about it anywhere else. You, you hear about the other famous vampires, you know, like the one for Vlad who, you know, used to oh, impale Dracula. people, Vlad. Yeah, so you hear more of that than Santorini because that one was a little bit later also in history time. So more things were documented and, you know, that kind of stuff where the, the Santorini one was more word of mouth. But um, because of the volcanoes and stuff, you had some of the open areas down below that got very cold. So, mm -hmm. you know, it just gave, it just, you know, vampires live down here. It's cold, it's dense, it's you know, dark. You don't go down there because, you know, you hear... When the wind goes through those those volcano tubes, they make some really weird sounds. So yes. you think, oh my God, it's a demon, it's a vampire, it's a ghoul, right. it's, you know, whatever, right? So, and not necessarily anything down there other than wind. So, you know, that's where a lot of legends and stuff got born, right? It was just out of pure fear. Now, did you meet any Santorini vampire hunters? No, but I did drink vampire's blood at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we're all about spirits, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Quite tasty. So I don't know what the celery stick was doing in there, but hey, it was vampire's blood, right? So it's all good. <laughs> now, this really intrigued me because uh, two passions of mine, one is vampires and the other one is uh, the island of Santorini. 
So we're going to explore my two passions together. First, we're going to talk about vampires. So Kim, you, uh, by your research, you were saying that vampires are associated with Slavic mythos and culture. Yeah, that's what they were talking about in the mythology world where that's, um, which is kind of weird because um, actually Slovenia, yeah, Transylvania is up that way. So I'm doing my the geography in my head, apologies. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think they're looking at modern time because I don't think um, uh, Slovenia was around way back when. <laughs> um, I think they're yeah. doing it off of modern maps, but um, it was up in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so when they started doing... So let's back up a few. So what happened, which brought the vampire craze to the world was um, a lot of people were dying of what they call consumption, mm -hmm. which was, um, I think, dysentery, if I remember correctly, or something it's, like that. It's um, uh, tuberculosis. Oh, thank you, tuberculosis. So you're coughing and, up a lot of blood. Yep. Um, so they didn't know what else to call it, but they call it consumption. But part of the problem was that... With tuberculosis, it's infectious, and they didn't know. And so someone's getting sick. Well, back then, everybody lived in the same house, if not the same room, right? Mm -hmm. One person would get sick, and then they would get really sick, and then they were on the verge of dying, and then somebody else would get sick, right? Or they would die, and then somebody would get sick a few days or a week later or something. So the, they weren't sure what was going on. They said that somebody had bad spirits or they were mm -hmm. haunted by demons or, you know, making something up, not realizing that it was actually an actual illness that was causing these problems. Yeah. So then um, somebody said, you know, it's a demon. We have to drive the demons out and because, well, so-and-so died. Let's dig them up. Well, problem is, is depending upon when you buried them, if you buried them yeah. in the middle of winter, right? The body doesn't decompose, right? So mm -hmm. they would find these bodies, you know, cold ground, and they weren't in the, they've been in earth, say three months, but they really hadn't decomposed, but the ground had been cold. So the body was naturally insulated and it didn't decompose because it was cold. And they're like, you know, which means everything inside the body just kind of froze and hung out, right? So uh, even after you die, your nails and your hair will grow a little bit before they actually physically stop because the body keeps doing what it's doing until it gets to a certain point. So people were mistaking this for you're still alive. Look, the nails have grown, the hair, the this, right? Look, mm -hmm. they still have blood in their mouth or whatever, right? Well, that's because the body, when you dug it up, it got warm. It, the fluids started melting, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. don't know how to put it. So they mistook it. And then they said, oh, this must be, you know, the vampire thing. And I'm not exactly where they got vampire as far as, you know, blood sucking corpse kind of a thing um, mm -hmm. that I'm still looking for. Oh, um, I know. Oh, what is it? Okay. Well, um, I will say uh, in the whole burial thing that you mentioned, mm -hmm. one of the other issues is now when people die, they do autopsies, you know, they make sure they look at what's the cause of death. Can we harvest any organs or, you know, or the person's cremated or whatnot. In the old days, they're like, oh, so-and-so's dead. Get them in the ground quickly before they ripen, before they start smelling, you know, before they start rotting. Oh, yeah. So if someone dies on Tuesday, they're in the ground by like Friday or Saturday. You don't want them lying around. Sometimes the person's not quite dead. Yeah, it's not a Monty Python yeah. sketch here. Sometimes yeah. the person isn't 100% dead. They may be in a bit of a coma or they may be nearly dead. And then they'll wake <laughs> mostly up. Mostly dead. <laughs> well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. <laughs> yes, mostly dead. Hail to the Princess Bride. <laughs> right? Sorry, it just came to me. <laughs> so they wake up and they're in a coffin underground. The first thing most people are going to do is freak out and panic. And in the panic, they, you know, may thrash around a bit. Oh my God, get me out, get me out, get me out. Um, and then they're going to run out of oxygen and they're going to die. 
Right. At that point, one of the common things they do when they die is bite their lip. So blood pours out. Okay. okay. The next morning or the next day or whatever, people walk over to the graveyard and they see disturbed earth. And they go, oh, and they they dig it up and they see their loved one looking a little contorted with blood and they're like they're a vampire so they put a stake in the heart and bury them again so this is also part of the myth in the victorian era it was a popular thing to sell a bell above ground that came to a string in the coffin And for, I think it would be like three days after the person is dead, people like peasants, this, this was something you had to be rich to get, um, but peasants would be hired to stand watch over the grave in, for, in shifts for three days. So if the bell rang, they would dig the person up. And that's where we came, that's where we got the term graveyard shift oh, from. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Another fun note for, for graveyard enthusiasts, this, this was a European thing. I don't know if it ever followed to America, but when they made a new uh, graveyard in Europe, somebody was picked out of a lottery and uh, they were buried alive in the new graveyard and they were considered the guardian of the new graveyard. Some people volunteered for it, but they, yeah. So yeah, fun note. That is words. creepy. It is, it is. But, you know, most people, they never really, if you ever seen people in Europe when they go to graveyards, they don't have the fear that we do at night. They're just like, okay, it's a graveyard. Well, you know, my grandpa's buried over here and grandma's over here, you know, there's mm -hmm. no, it's it's really different the yeah. views on the, um, graveyards and spirits and stuff. So yeah. anyways, um, okay. so coming back around to vampires, <laughs> sorry, it's like, so I did want to mention some of the other global uh, histories behind vampire, because okay. you said uh, when he looked it up online, and I also looked, they kept saying Slavic, Slavic, vampirism is a global thing, because keep in mind, people have been buried alive all over the world, this is nothing new. Um, there are uh, different cultures, and I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to give the actual names and places, but long ago, there were some people who lived in jungle style um, who would sharpen their teeth to be more carnivorous because, you know, oh, with yeah. humans, our teeth are more, herb, you know, it's, we're omnivorous, but our teeth are more for herbivores and the yeah. herbivore side than the carnivore side. Yeah. So there were people who would sharpen their teeth so that they could appear more like an animal. And this would make them look terrifying when like the English or the whoever would come exploring. Oh, <laughs> we own this place now. We're, oh, we've yeah. discovered it. And then these like <laughs> people appear and they have like these sharp teeth. So that, that was part of the Caribbean, actually, you know, the Caribbean and along the, uh, the eastern coast, northeastern coast of Central and South America. And then in Africa, there were different cultures of vampires. And part of that came from um, after war, drinking blood of the- Oh yeah, very common. Yeah, and that was in South America. I mean, that's global. It's like, yeah. if you go to war, you're gonna end up with some of your enemy's blood in your mouth just by the act of fighting. <laughs> Ask any MMA fighter. <laughs> um, so um, there were uh, some cultures where when they went to war, the point of it was not for us to kill as many of you as we can or you to kill as many of us as we can. It was to, there would be more posturing and combat and stuff, but the goal was not death. So when it was determined who was the superior warriors, the ones that had um, been combated over, they're like, you know what, you are better than us, you win, would cut and give some of their blood as tribute. And the victors would really? drink the blood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 
Sounds yeah, a little more civilized than today, but <laughs> it really I'm does. I'm telling you, if you want to see refined civilization, go back to primitive people because they understand if we go and kill all of them and they kill all of us, then who's there's none of us yeah. left. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, and, you know, historically around the world, there were cultures that uh, shaved down their teeth. Yes. Um, for different reasons. It could be they thought it was attractive, just okay. like flattening heads and stuff like that. It could be to appear more menacing, or it could be to be more like one with the environment, or it could be it was uh, showing what stature you were within your society. But when, you know, the European and British explorers came along and said, we own this place now, everyone <laughs> seems primitive to them. And they didn't think about, like, these people have their own culture. So they're like, oh, they have sharp teeth. They're vampires. <laughs> well, out of curiosity, during the time that they were doing this, did um, they have, like, cutting utensils or anything? Or did they, like, use their teeth to rip? The meat a bit of both okay depending so it's on the, you know because there's always like stone and obsidian for cutting true yeah but if you yeah. don't know to use it to cut that's why i was thinking maybe the teeth would allow them to rip yeah. the and some meat. some cultures did have metallurgy but yeah the teeth for ripping the meat was definitely a, a benefit for them that's now nice. getting to back to the slavic <laughs> one of the reasons i love vampires is when I was growing up, one of my friends, uh, Gary Vlad, was a direct <laughs> descender, descendant of Vlad the Impaler. Really? Mm -hmm. and, oh my god, all through high school, I was so in love with him. <laughs> he Did you do that want to drink your blood? I mean, no, <laughs> no, you know, he had that kind of Slavic wild wolfish look to him and he had the animal magnetism that they talk about. Oh, he did. He really, like, when he walked in the room, all of us girls just got weak in the knees. And <laughs> he was just, like, the nicest guy. I, he had no clue. I mean, if he did, he didn't show. Like, he was just a genuinely nice guy. Um, but, oh, my God, I was so in love with him. Um, and his family, his parents had, like, copies of Vlad the Impaler's journals. And of course, Vlad the Impaler is who Count Dracula was based on. Right. He was a Slavic nobility. Um, and when, oh my God, who was it? The French? I, God, this is so bad that I'm spacing on my history. But, you know, the they, they were going to come and conquest them and turn all of them into good Christian and this and that. And he's like, no, he was a ruthless military leader. He Basically. did tactics that were just like, like impaling people upside down while they're still alive. The thing is, yeah, like, like now to his people, he was beloved. He was a very good noble leader. He was super smart, super well-educated, and really into the occult and mythology and stuff like that. Also really scientific. Like, he knew how to impale someone without killing them. Um, <laughs> upside down. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the Count Dracula mythology was created on this very real man who was a fascinating complicated brilliant man and a brilliant strategist and military leader um, whose people did very well you know compared to other places like you know a peasant's a peasant but maybe his had less complaints hence rising up count dracula who everyone was under his spell but here's the kicker gary his incisor teeth were really long. His, like, I don't know if it's everyone in his family, but it's definitely a, a family trait. His little <laughs> brother had to have his teeth sort of shaved down a little bit because they were too long hanging over his really? lip. Yeah. So, but I am telling you, 
the nicest family. And like to this day, there's a part of me that's still madly in love with this <laughs> charismatic, nice guy with such magnetism and, uh, you know, a real wolfish look. But so when we look at vampires now on Earth, we're finding very real connection here, like real roots. But if we go to other dimensions, 